Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Mark in the New Testament, chapter 9, verses 14 through 32. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd among them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy, the father, exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. This is God's word. Is it possible to believe and not believe at the same time? That was evidently the experience of this desperate man who brought his troubled son to Jesus so he would heal him. And his... His words, his prayer of anguish, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. They've always meant a great deal to me personally, probably because I think they resemble me a lot. And it makes me wonder how much nuance there actually is to to the spiritual experience of the average person. We're in a brief series called The Dance of Faith, and we're exploring this, that, there, that, that faith and unbelief don't exist so much as a strict binary. You either believe or you don't believe. That there's movement within both. That there's a dance of sorts between faith and doubt, between joy and grief, maybe even anguish. And I think the story of this desperate father is going to help us appreciate this nuance And it'll help us to empathize with people who struggle to believe for one important reason, because we all do. This story also, I think, gives us some helps to know how to do exactly what the man prayed to Jesus for, help me overcome my unbelief. So let's break it down just in two different uh, ways. One, let's think a a little bit about the difficulty of belief, and then how to overcome unbelief. So first of all, the difficulty of belief. You have the obvious example of this father who is struggling with his faith, but he's not the only, by by any stretch, he's not the only example of individuals in this scene who are struggling. Did you notice that? To begin with, uh, in the section right before Steve began to read, it's actually part of the larger narrative here. It's one of the um, epic mountaintop experiences in the Bible, literally, Jesus goes up on a mountaintop with his three closest friends, and right there before them, his clothes 
turned dazzling white, somehow the prophet Elijah and the great Moses of the Old Testament appear before him and Jesus is transfigured, the transfiguration. It's an incredibly important, famous moment. They go down from the mountain and it's sort of like when Moses came down from the mountain when he got the Ten Commandments and you think, oh, all of God's people are just going to be standing there waiting to receive. No, they'd formed a, a, an idol, a golden calf. And we're worshiping it. It's very similar. They come down from the Mount of Transfiguration. Instead of all the disciples being strong of faith, it says that they couldn't heal this boy who the Father had brought to them. Now, it's an important sidebar here. The expectation is not that anyone who believes can heal people. These were the apostles. There's a very unusual, unique subset of human beings. And we learned earlier in the Gospel of Mark, they had been given authority to do certain things. One of them was to heal people as a sign that the kingdom of God was coming in the person of Jesus. But he says, you know, this they weren't able to do it. Why weren't they able to do it? This type can only come out by prayer. What's going on there? Scholars say that really is code for you guys were depending on your own you maybe past record of spiritual success. You weren't depending on God. You weren't trusting in him to work through you to bring about healing. So they were struggling to believe, the disciples themselves. Toward the end of this segment, when Jesus says, look, we've got to proceed on our mission. This is what I'm all about. I've got to go to Jerusalem so that I can what? Suffer and die and be raised again. And what does it say? It says um, they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They were struggling to believe even what was most crucial, what Jesus was about to engage in, and they didn't believe. And uh, on top of all this, of course, you have when Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples are caught in an argument with the religious leaders of the day. These are the people of anybody who should have been strong in faith, but they're not just struggling to believe. They outright don't believe in Jesus. So there's a lot of different examples of people struggling to believe. Now, there are some influences here that I think are important for us to notice. There's at least three different dynamics in this story that are important for us to understand as contributing uh, elements to the struggle to believe, and because I think they're ones that we struggle with as well. We need to be aware of them. The first one is cultural pressures. Exasperated, Jesus says at one point, Mark 9, 19, you unbelieving generation. Now, sometimes uh, people will say, well, obviously Jesus was a culture warrior here. And, you know, for the church to be uh, pure in its following of Jesus, then you need to sort of insulate yourself from the evils of the world. That's not what was going on here. Uh, Jesus was not a culture war. He, but, but one thing he is highlighting is that in every culture, in every age, there are certain pressures that make it more difficult for us to believe. Now, just take one example right here. You might, as a sophisticated, educated, modern, read this and go, oh my goodness, you can't expect me to believe in demon possession. That, you know, the, underneath this boy's troubles, there was an evil spirit that had possessed him. You can't expect me to believe that. Uh, that was, they lived in a pre-scientific age where people believed in those sorts of things, but not so today. But why do you think that? You say, well, because we don't see that all over the place. Well, even in the Bible, did you know, demon possession was incredibly rare. Now, it seems to pop up with some frequency in the Gospels of the New Testament, but why? Because Jesus is there. And if Jesus was who he claimed to be, the Son of God, the Messiah, the long-anticipated King who would usher in uh, an age of healing, the king of righteousness, wouldn't it make sense 
that if there was a devil, if there were demons, that they would manifest their presence in the presence of Jesus Christ. The logic to me seems pretty sound on that front. And I don't think, you know, as you look at the world, the evils that exist around us, do we really need to be convinced that there is this mysterious presence called evil in the world? You say, well, okay, but in terms of the pressures of culture, sometimes I just feel like people who don't share my faith think I'm weird. Okay, uh, maybe that's just part of it, that we need to have enough courage if you would consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ to recognize that sometimes people just aren't going to understand you. But even Friedrich Nietzsche, not a friend of Christianity, said those who were seen dancing were thought to be insane by those who could not hear the music. As a Christian, we would say that we're animated, our life is animated by the music of the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel. It's going to lead us out in life, carrying ourselves at times in ways that not only seem off or different to people, they might even think you're absolutely insane. But as someone once said, look, if, if Jesus, borrowing on the metaphor here of demon possession, if Jesus Christ possesses you, he will drive, he will drive you absolutely sane. So the first is cultural pressure. The second is religious people. I mean, if you're part of the crowd that's watching this as Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration, how confusing to have the official religious leaders in a, an intense argument with the leaders of Jesus Christ's movement. And interestingly, it was right after this, that Jesus says that statement, you unbelieving generation. Maybe that's more what he was referring to. Here are the religious leaders and his own leaders, the ones who should have been aligned, and yet they're not. And so I think plenty of us have been confused. We've found our faith uh, to be challenged. Maybe it's led to you to uh, do it is called deconstructing our faith because of the example of religious leaders. How could this Christianity thing be real with this hypocrisy, with this backbiting, with all this infighting and judgmentalism? That's a pressure. And just being aware of it is helpful. The third pressure that we see here contributing to uh, the struggle to believe is maybe the most obvious in this passage, and it is focusing on this man, this father who brings his son, because it's, it's the pressure of suffering. Now, sometimes uh, in, in the Christian world, you will hear Christians talk about how through their suffering, they have grown in their faith, that suffering is this, uh, this refining fire. It is this... Uh, place in which God burns away the dross and refines our faith. And that is true. It's absolutely true. But we don't want to truncate the process of that. When you're in the midst of suffering, it can often feel like your spiritual life is a foreign experience to you. All you have to do is read the book of Psalms in the Old Testament. It is a common thread throughout the Psalms, that the psalmist who has faith is struggling deeply. God, why are you hiding your face from me? Where are you, God? Why have you abandoned me? And here this man, I mean, what could be more precious to a father than his son? But his son was possessed by a spirit that had robbed him of his health. He couldn't hear, he couldn't speak. In addition to this, he had symptoms that we would say are probably common to uh, epilepsy, violent seizures that threw him to the ground, caused him to foam at the mouth, gnash at his teeth and become rigid. He was obviously disturbed. He was unstable and unhinged. 
And yet his situation is an extreme example of something that is common to every one of our lives, that there is a destabilizing power to disappointment. We have our moments where we feel like we go up the mountain, an epic spiritual moment, but how long do those tend to last? They are fleeting. The confidence, therefore, of our faith is not in those moments of experience. It's in the one who went up the mountain for us, Jesus. Because disappointment is, uh, you know, like the, the demon-possessed spirit that was like a thief in this boy's life, stealing his health from him, suffering and disappointment in our life, steal from us the joy of our salvation. So it's not easy to believe. Um, there, there's a lot in here that, that we can begin to see contributes to this, though. Whether it's um, the pressures of culture, religious people, or suffering. And that means that it's okay to be in process, to be in this dance. Some of us have been in religious environments where it's illegal to believe. Uh, it's sort of like the, the words of that great dark lord, Darth Vader. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Have you been in experiences like that in a church, in a Bible study, where it's just sort of nauseating at times how absolutely certain some people can be? And what does it make you feel like? Shameful for struggling in the midst of it. And yet if we appreciate that there's a dance to all this, it helps us to become an incredibly empathetic person to other people, uh, to, to, to enter into those words that the great Southern writer Flannery O'Connor once said, no suffering is greater than what is caused by the doubts of those who want to believe. City Church exists in part to be this kind of a space for people not who have it all together, who are airtight in their certainty of what they believe or don't believe, but people who, who, like the Father, come and say, look, I don't have it all together. I believe and I don't believe. Help me overcome. Help me overcome. Whether I am up the mountain in a season of joy or really struggling in the depths to enter into that dance, as uh, David Bowie once sang, to dance the blues. So that's the difficulty of belief. Let's look now at overcoming belief. Because uh, while there's no formula here, there are at least three things that I think we can take away from this that will help us overcome unbelief. First of all, the example of the man. What did he do? He did all he could do. Bring his son to Jesus. And admit, admit that he was weak. Do you know there is an uncommon spiritual strength in weakness? The most famous sermon ever preached, Jesus begins by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. He says, Lord, I believe, but I am riddled with doubts. Help me overcome my unbelief. And so when we're suffering and experiencing a loss, it's the example of the man is this invitation to just come right as you are to Jesus, not having it all together, not even sure maybe what you believe or don't believe, and do what he did. I mean, he was in effect praying. It's just Jesus was right there before him. But that conversation he had was an anguished prayer. And so whatever you're going through right now, that is what you also can do. My wife, Ellen, and I are working through a, a book, a devotional by uh, the author Kate Bowler, who is a professor at Duke Divinity School. She herself is having to endure um, the intense trauma of, um, of cancer. And she says this in a prayer, God, 
We are in this together, so dance me through it. Lead me to where I feel closer to you in my sadness and remind me that I never walk alone. So the example of the man is the first thing that we see that I think can help us overcome our unbelief. Come exactly as you are. The second is the voice from the mountain. You know, we mentioned that Jesus went up the mountain and uh, in the midst of all this, one thing I didn't mention earlier is that God the Father speaks into that moment. And he says this. He says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. So what is the voice from the mountain saying that might be really helpful in overcoming unbelief? Listening to the Son. And the great, because you might say, well, goodness, I don't, I don't hear him. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> That's what we have in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. In fact, in Luke 24, in the New Testament, after Jesus died and rose again, he appeared to some of his disciples and he said that all of the scriptures of the Old and New Testament are talking about him. To put it differently, if you want to know the voice of Jesus, you find it by meditating upon the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. And I think it's an interesting thing when you think about it, this idea of listening to his voice, because think about this evil spirit that had tormented this young boy. What it left him with was a position where he couldn't hear. And yet, even to someone like him, who is healed by Jesus, the voice of Jesus can overcome that. He can overcome anything in our life that's an obstacle to belief. Just listening to him. So whatever stands in your way, letting his voice in Scripture argue with those competing voices, cultural pressures, religious people, even suffering in our own life. Not allowing those things to mute the voice, but letting his voice overcome. Those pressures will help us overcome our unbelief. The example of boy and the voice from the mountain, and thirdly and finally, the reaction of the people. Back to, I mean, just placing yourself in that crowd. It's kind of chaotic, right? Jesus, you're hearing from some of his disciples, has just been transfigured on the mount. Elijah and Moses were there. But then all this bickering and arguing by the religious leaders down below. And this poor troubled boy and the desperate father. How do you make sense of all of it? But I love what Mark records in Mark 9, verse 15. It says, as soon as all the people saw Jesus... They were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to him. Life can be so destabilizing. Looking to Jesus, again, through the scriptures of the Old and New Testament, has that unique stabilizing power for us. And pay attention specifically to the movement of Jesus in this passage. From glory on the mountain to at the end of this passage talking about where he was headed, the grace of the cross, that he who had everything gave it all up. Why? To do what we see in the middle where he heals the boy. That boy, the healing of the boy becomes a, a picture for you and me of our condition. How torn apart our lives are. And yet, the singular power of Jesus accomplished in his movement from glory to the cross brings about that healing. It's, it's God's love, his fierce love more than anything else that has the power to overcome our unbelief. We see all of this in uh, one of the most famous oil paintings in history. Uh, in fact, for several hundred years, it was regarded as the most important 
oil painting by the great Italian master of the High Renaissance, Raphael. It was his last and uh, last work and unfinished, actually. But it combines these two parts of the larger narrative. You can see the top, the transfiguration, down below the chaos of all the people. Everyone seems to be moving a different direction. And then just the, the, the horror of the troubled boy and the desperation of the father. And yet one thing to notice, there's one individual doing something no one else is doing. You notice that individual cloaked in red in the upper left or the middle left. What's he doing? He's pointing to Jesus. Belief and unbelief are not easy things. Amidst our confusion and the chaos, the most important thing we can do is not mute the most important voice, but to listen, look, and let the love of God in Jesus overwhelm you with wonder. And as the music of his gospel begins to play out in our lives, even and especially in the most difficult struggles of our lives, don't be surprised if a new dance begins to emerge so that you can say and sing with the ancient songwriter, O oh Lord, you turned my wailing into dancing. Let me pray. Oh, Father, thank you that your word is so realistic that it doesn't describe the spiritual experience in glossed over pietistic ways. But like this very narrative, yes, there are great mountaintop moments of spiritual discovery, but so much of life is lived down below where there's confusion, there's, there's struggle, and yet, like that one disciple doing all he could do, pointing to Jesus, would you, Holy Spirit, even now, direct us to the Son, to that one who can bring healing to our lives, who can overcome our unbelief, who can bring that kind of spiritual equilibrium where life can feel so destabilized and can turn our wailing into dancing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.